Welcome to Better by Great Place to Work, the podcast that helps companies create a great workplace for all because it's better for people, better for business, and better for the world. I'm Christopher Tkachuk, the Chief Content Officer at Great Place to Work. Each week, we meet with great leaders who have helped their companies become better workplaces by focusing on their best asset, their people, who in turn help their organizations become more successful. Support for Better comes from DHL Express, the global market leader in international express delivery. Hello, my name is Michael C. Bush. I'm the global CEO of Great Place to Work, and it's my honor today, as a part of the Better Great Place to Work podcast, to be with Ken Allen. Thank you, Mike. Michael, it's a very great pleasure to be here. Um, It's my first time at a Great Place to Work conference, and so far, I found it outstanding. We're good. We're very, very happy to have you. So there's a couple of things I wanted to spend some time talking about. First, I wanted to spend some time talking about your book, which I read, (laughs) and I just want to share what I read with our listeners. I think they're going to get a lot out of it. And then we'll probably talk about a few other things (laughs) that we both find to be interesting. (laughs) Ken Allen is a no-nonsense minor son from Yorkshire who rose to become the global CEO of a company with operations in more countries than the United Nations and is credited with an astounding financial turnaround after years of stagnation and loss. He is a simple man who has rung the bell on on Wall Street, shaken hands with the Pope, and even met the Rolling Stones. He was voted Germany's number one turnaround manager and is known as the singing CEO in China. So today, we're going to hear from Ken Allen, who is currently the CEO of e-commerce for DHL. But uh, what a tremendous career that you've had. And what made you take the time to write the book? Well, it was an absolute opportune time. A lot of things were coming to, to a head. First of all, it was DHL's 50th anniversary in 2019. Uh, we were born here in San Francisco in, back in 1969. And, you know, and we were a very disruptive industry. Uh, and uh, by 2019... Um, 50 years old, we were what I call a mature disruptor. Now we're helping new disruptors in the e-commerce space to get access to markets globally instantaneously. Yeah. Secondly, um, I've been with DHL since uh, 1985, but for the last 10 years, I was the global CEO and did the, the big turnaround. And I think 10 years as CEO is probably a good time to think about letting somebody else come through and then the group wanted me to do another job as well, right? So I I was coming to the end of my uh, long tenure with DHL Express and it just felt like um, drawing that line, writing down the story uh, up to 2019 and then leave it up to my predecessor to take uh, over from there. Okay, well, what we love about it, being (laughs) a great place to work for all, is you're helping all, not just people at DHL. You're helping every business leader uh, who was trying to find uh, a way to do business in a way that's that's humane. So we we certainly appreciate that. One of the things that that stood out to me is you mentioned there's nothing common about common sense. That's right. Could you say a little more about that? Yeah. Well, I think that's the whole essence of the book. That's why I call the book Radical Simplicity. You know, and I call it radical because you've got to really work hard at it. You know, if you just let things go along, complexity comes in, bureaucracy comes in. And so there's nothing basic about the basics. You have to know the detail of the industry that you're in. You've got to be able to convey that message in a clear, concise manner to everybody through through the organization. And when we talk about simplicity, simplicity doesn't mean easy. And radical simplicity is even more difficult. It's, it's knowing in huge depth your business and being able to explain that to everybody in the organization, what their role is and where you want to get to. Um, and it's, it's so important that it gets right through the organization because if the person on the front floor, uh, on the shop floor, isn't with you, then the organization is never going to achieve greatness. Yeah, one of the things for, for the people who are listening I love about your book cover is it's radical in big letters. <laughs> yeah. And then in small letters, simplicity, simplicity. Yeah. which anybody who reads the book and anybody who's led an organization know there's nothing easy about it at all. Right. And, and your approach was certainly radical. You talked about exiting markets, uh, bold plans, uh, all the things that you were facing, all the turmoil. What's it like now as you think back to those moments? What happens to you emotionally? I mean, the story has had a happy ending. Yeah. But can you go back to when you didn't know if the story was going to have a happy ending? Yeah. And uh, some of it is a blur when you look back because it all happened so quickly. And actually, you know, the, the turnaround time... Um, uh, was r- relatively quick. But just back to the beginning of the story. So DHL, um, as we say, born in 1969, grew rapidly. 
a lot like the uh, disruptors of today. You know, it built a great brand very quickly, it expanded worldwide extremely fast, um, uh, very good with its customers, you know, built a big brand name. Never had the financial discipline, though. Never knew how to convert its great operations and its brand name into uh, financial success. And at the end of the day, you know, as Peter Drucker used to say, results are the only true signs of excellence. Now, I, I think in today's world, we're a multi-stakeholder society, so there's, there's a bit more balance there. Um, but then by 2002, it was losing about 153 million a year um, on a five, six billion turnover. Deutsche Post saw the big opportunity, you know, the German postal, like all the postals around the world, their business was, uh, was shrinking. They needed to be in global logistics and DHL with a great brand name um, was an obvious target. So they bought DHL. Uh, the problem was that they tried to um, make it more profitable by integrating it with businesses outside of its core competence, domestic businesses. And the worst one was a big acquisition that was made in the U.S., and so when I came to the U.S. in 2008, 2007, sorry, um, we were losing over $130 million a week, a month, sorry, a, a month. I'm a great believer in speaking to frontline people and working with people on the call face to see, you know, what, is, what, is, what has gone wrong. Um, so I spent six months crisscrossing. Uh, at the end of the day, we realized that we were never going to turn that business around and nobody uh, wanted to buy it. And don't forget at that time as well, we were just approaching the global financial sure. crisis as well. The markets in the US were already starting to go down. So we had to take a big step. It was very tough. We had to lay a lot of people off. And I think that was the point at which, you know, I really started to think about, you know, the role of managers the role of leaders is to make sure that our people never have to go through anything like that ever again. I think, you know, sometimes the turnaround artists, um, you know, get all the hero worship and they're held up there, right? The real heroes are the people who grow their business every single year, you know, 5, 10, 15%, whatever it is, make a, a nice profit, grow the company, grow the individuals uh, on, on a firm footing. And so after we went through that quite very, very difficult period. Uh, and, and that year, 2008, when I left, we, we lost 2.2 billion. Um, I just had to start leveraging all the things that we're really good at, get back to, you know, what makes us great. We were still the worldwide leader in time definite international shipments. Um, our people still had a lot of passion. They just needed pointing in the right direction. Well, facing that financial <laughs> pressure, it's just amazing to me that you say, well, I use the simple people-based approach, mm -hmm. music, sport, love, and logistics. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, how do you come up with that under that kind of pressure? Well, because I think you have to get the message through to everybody. And so first of all, I think when you, t when you talk about strategy, I think there's only one strategist in a company. Now, a lot of people aren't going to agree with me on that, but I think the CEO, he's got to set, set the strategy. Obviously, he takes other people's opinions, but he sets the strategy and he's responsible for it. And I think what we do want with strategy, we want it be, to be consistent over a long period of time. 86% of the strategies are the same anyway, right? It's the execution that's the real um, critical part of it. So I wanted to make sure that everybody understood our, our strategy. And what I was told, uh, and I think it's, it bears out, is that it takes about a year for every level of organization for the message to get through. So you better have a long-term um, vision and set it down. Otherwise, it's going to be changing uh, yeah. every two minutes. And, and then how do you get that through to a frontline courier, a customer service agent? Um, it's using things like music, sport, love, and logistics. And so we, we approached it from the, um, the service profit chain, something that's really well established. Every know, everybody knows all about it, right? So we had motivated people deliver great service quality, great service quality results in loyal customers. Loyal customers are your best advert and they're the, your best source of future profits. And then we thought, well, how do we get those messages through to a frontline guy? We said, okay, let's have a song for each one. So in the, in the 1980s, we'd used Ain't No Mountain High Enough as, a, as an advertising campaign. And so it just fitted in. It's almost like that song was written for us, uh, motivated people. If you need me, call me. 
No matter where you are, no matter how far, I'll be there in a hurry. On that you can depend and never worry. Because, baby, there ain't no mountain high enough. And what we were saying there was there's no mountain high enough that we won't go through for our customers. And you, you, you can see when you go to a, a lot of our stations, people get up and sing it. My management dance to it. So that's the motivated people bit. And then um, great, great service quality. I think motivated people deliver great service quality for two reasons. First of all, they will follow process because they know systemically the, the, the network works. If you do everything right, uh, the shipment will, will move from San Francisco to Montevideo, Uruguay without problems. So motivated people know that. They also know um, that if something goes wrong, they have to show a lot of empathy for customer because customer is our rallying cry. In fact, we even call it insanely customer-centric um, culture. Um, so on the great service quality, we just wanted people to love our customers. And again, we had a, an old um, advertising campaign that used the song, what the world needs now is love, sweet love, because I think the world does need it. You know, and people need to know that when they're at work, you know, that they should show um, empathy and compassion to um, their associates, but also to customers as well, if anything does go wrong. Loyal customers. Um, we have a, uh, our own in-house quality system called First Choice, and it was all about making um, life simpler for our customers. Uh, and there's a, there's a great song called Simplicity. Um, simplicity, it works for me. It keeps me running hard and sharp and true. I focus on the basic stuff. Pretty soon I'm coming up on you. So it's all about, you know, sticking to your knitting. Know what your core business is and do it to the absolute best of your ability, right? And, and people can relate to that. And then what I always say is if you do all those things right, you don't even need finance people because the, <laughs> the, the, profits will, uh, the profits will come flooding in. And the great thing about when we built that strategy um, – Somebody in the field, it was an IT guy in the field, came and said, oh, Ken, I've got a great song for um, Profitable Network. I said, no, what's that? And it was uh, Travis McCoy and Bruno Mars, you know. Want to be a billionaire so freaking bad. UPS and FedEx will be sad. Want to be on the cover of Forbes magazine. TNT is never to be seen. So setting out that strategy like that in such a simple way Everybody understood it. In fact, one of the proudest moments um, I, I had is when we were doing the Certified International Training uh, Program was a courier from South Africa. And he stood up on film and he goes, you know, you know, we've all got to keep ourselves up. We've got to smile every day because that's what the customer expects. And we've got to deliver great. And he just went through the whole thing. And so, you know, at that point that it's right through the organization. Well, every organization talks about communication and how to do it. Yeah. What's amazing about your story is you innovated, created a brand new way of doing it, yeah. um, and which meant you cared not only about the company and the message, but you cared about the people. Mm -hmm. And you wanted to find something that would resonate within them, which means you had to know your people. Yeah. So um, what was part of the secret, especially during the turnaround, of getting the right people? Well, the amazing thing is that all the right people were already there. I, I, and I think this is the, the key essence of, of leadership. It, it's got to be somehow monitored, right? Because leaders can create greatness or they can totally destroy it. And the problem is when, 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 when people don't run businesses properly, it's not the C-suite that suffers that much. You know, worst case, they, they might lose their job, but they have a you know, million per dollar package payoff. Yeah. It's the people on the front line who've been working crazy, right, to try and keep the company going, to try and make, you know, to cover up some of the faults that the, uh, the management's made. Um, so when I got into the United States, I just, found, you know, we, we, we got rid of half the board. But a lot of, when I, when I first got to the United States, and this is one of the complex things that can happen in business, there was like a 16-man board, but not one of them, not one person had any um, experience in domestic U.S business. You know, they, they had, some were from the old DHL on the international, some were from freight forwarders, others were from IBM and other companies. And so it's almost incredible to, to find a situation like that. But that's the situation um, we were in. But beneath that, you know, when you got to the station managers and, and uh, the depot, people in the hub, 
There were great people there that were so frustrated. A lot of the good ones had left, but they were frustrated. But then you, we found them, and you know, a lot of them now are in very, very senior positions. Uh, you know, Mike Parra, who runs the Americas, uh, Travis Cobb, who's the global operations manager now, they were in America at the time, and we found those nuggets within the organization, and that's why we were able to turn it around so fast, and then they went on um, to, 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 to big positions around the network and around the world. So the people are there. And I think, you know, in, in, you know Jim Collins says uh, in, in Good to Great and How the Mighty Fall, um, most good to great managers, not all, um, but most of them come from within the organization. So look, because the people who are in the organization understand the culture, and a lot of time they know what's, uh, what's wrong and how to fix it. Mm -hmm. Well, there's a quote in your book uh, from Her Herbert Bayard Swope. Can't give a formula for success, but I can give a formula for failure. It is trying to please everybody. Absolutely, yeah. And again, that's why I think this, that's the, one of the resounding messages out of radical simplicity. Find out what you're good at. Make sure that you're delivering best in class, best in the world service in that particular piece. And from focus comes growth. There's, if you've got a world-class product, um, you'll always find a way to grow it. Um, and you always find ways to get, to get better and better. So, you know, towards the end of my tenure, um, for the first time we went out and we bought 14 triple seven aircraft, right? Gave my uh, CFO a heart attack. But, you know, we came to the point where we kept saying, why should the banks and the, um, the, the rental people and, 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 you know, the third party operators, why should they make money when we're taking all the risk? And we knew there was no risk actually because they were already flying, um, you know, routes that were, that were pretty full. But the more you focus on your own business and you, the more you look for opportunity, um, you're going to find it. And we are, we are now at the forefront of this e-commerce revolution. So, you know, um, we're delivering all over the world instantaneously um, for entrepreneurs because we built this fantastic network. And so we're in 220 countries. You know, we are the most international company in the world, which is something that is, is, is a big statement, but we're all very proud of it. But now, if you're an entrepreneur in Peru and you come up with a great idea, even if you're in a remote village, you can put it online. People in America can buy it. We can tell you how much it's going to cost to pick it up, customs clear it, deliver it to somebody. Uh, and then, you know, it's, it's opening markets instantaneously um, to everybody. So it's, um, it's a fantastic opportunity. Well, a lot of what you've done in the book is you, you take these complex subjects and, and come up with a simple way of describing them, like mm -hmm. the four pillars. Yeah. Can you talk a little about, about that? Yeah. Well, as I, get, as I say, I think simplicity doesn't mean easy. I, I, wonder, one of the, I didn't put it in the book, but one of the best examples I've, I've got on that is Davos. Davos, right? So sim what's a simple idea? Oh, we'll get the best business people in the world. We'll get the leading politicians of the world. We'll get the best scientists in the world. Um, we'll get the best activists in the world. We'll get them all together and we'll discuss how to make the world a better place. It's a simple concept, right? But, you know. Not easy. Not easy, right. So on my, I have a, 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 form, a formula I call self-reflection. So S is simplicity. That's the idea. Then E, which is the most difficult part, and execution to me is strategy itself in, in most cases, right? So execution, yeah, how do you do that? You know, how do you get all those egos together? How do you make that kind of thing happen? Well, then you need, you go into the L, leadership. Somebody like Klaus Schwab stepped out, just like you've done, if I might say, with a great place to work, um, and pulled it all together and kept it going, right? And F at the end for focus. It, he could have gone in in multiple directions, right? But he's kept it there every single year. He's got a great um, uh, overriding banner, you know, human capital, the fourth industrial uh, revolution and everything else. And so that's the way I think we've, we've got to approach it. And when you break it down like that, it's easy to explain to everybody. Because some people say, well, you know, Davos is elite. Well, everything's elite, right? You know, if you go to the Super Bowl final, you know, it's elite. Sure. If you've got any, anything has got to have, have elites yeah. there, right? It's how you pull it all together. Yeah. And that's at one level. And therefore, the, you know, the four pillars for everybody who works in the organization. If, you, if you're a country or regional CEO or you're um, a courier, the simple four pillars that motivated people 
who are exceptionally well trained, which is what we put a lot of time and effort into, deliver great service quality, which is what the customer's paying for. Customer just wants it to work right, great service quality. Keep your customers loyal. Loyal customers are the bedrock of everything. And, and one of the things that I think that we did so successfully, how, how would you galvanize people? If you galvanize them around customers and you say, look, the purpose of a business is to create and keep a customer. If there's no customers, there's no growth, there's no salary increase, yeah. there's no development. So if we get everybody to really understand that everything that they're doing is about fulfilling that customer's needs so that they continue to give us business, tell other people how good we are and we continue to grow, and then they'll take us into other um, areas that we can expand into as well, that will give us a, um, a, uh, a profitable network. And also... If you are giving great service quality and all the rest of it, don't be scared to ask for a tiny premium. I'm not saying 15%. I'm yeah. saying the, 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 the number one, the leader, should be able to have a, 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 a premium that allows him to make good profits and reinvest that into the business, into the people and, every, uh, uh, you know, and the assets that run it. Can you uh, tell the audience about your CIS program? Yeah. what it is and where that idea came from and how your CFO reacted when you <laughs> yeah, talked about the program. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, well, CIS came about, where, so when we decided to pull out of the domestic piece only of the United States, right? You know, you can't be a global player and not have a presence in the United States. So we closed down the domestic business there. And therefore, I said, look, you know, we're going to focus on what we world leaders already at, right? What we invented, you know, the um, time-definite international ship, uh, ship shipping. So I came up with this program. I said, I'm going to look, everybody is going to become a certified international specialist. We're going to look at our history. We're going to look at our culture. Um, and we're going to take it forward. We're not going to dwell on it, but we're going to find all those things that were great about it, about what we did over time to become the world leader and pull it all together. And therefore, you know, we needed to, to, to create this. It wasn't really a culture change. It was a, a cultural booster, right? So we invested... A lot of money. <laughs> we just started to turn the corner, and this, you know, this was a hundred uh, million dollar program, right? You know, yeah. The CFO came to me and she said, "Ken, Ken, what if we invest all this money, right, and people leave?" And I said, "Melanie, what if we don't and they stay?" Yes, <laughs> yeah. So that's that's one thing. But I think everybody really saw the benefit of it, and it became something of of a phenomenon, right? I always carry my passport all the time with me, right? But what it's become now, you know, we hear in some of the conversations today about the, the concept of family. So now if you work for DHL anywhere in the world, you have a passport. This means that, you know, we're all, we're all connected. We're all a family, right? Don't care what color you are. Don't care what religion you are. I don't care what sexual orientation you are. I don't care about anything, right? Do you love our customers and do you love the people that you're working with? And do you want to deliver great service quality? If the answer to that is yes, you're part of the family. And then I think... When we pull everybody together like that, and, you know, one of the things that we do, we have these uh, soccer tournaments, and, you know, we had one in the Middle East. We had people there from Iran and Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, Syria. And, you know, the other thing we had, we had a, a women's football team from Saudi Arabia. I never thought I would see that in my lifetime. From Iran, from Kuwait, from Syria. They played together. They celebrated together. And I just thought, you know, if, if politicians could see what normal people are like, yeah. it's, 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 there's no end to, you know, to what we, can, what we can achieve. And I think because political parties, you know, have some inherent interests, global companies like ours, they've got to step forward and, you know, really become the change that, that we want to see. Uh, because I don't think governments can, can, can really do it. But when you see frontline people all working together, all with a common purpose, you know, we talk a lot about diversity, but we, we, we're more aligned than we are diverse. There's, 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 you know, there's nothing that should stop us, you know, hitting some of these big dreams. This podcast is brought to you by DHL Express, the global market leader in international express delivery. Recognized globally on Great Place to Work's World's Best Workplaces list, DHL Express makes a positive contribution to the world by connecting people and enabling global trade. 
while being committed to responsible business practices, purposeful environmental activities, and corporate citizenship. Learn more at DHL.com. Well, you know, one of the things I know about DHL, just getting to know DHL, is that companies have a way of describing the way you should take care of your employees. It's, a, it's one thing to describe it. It's another thing to actually do it. Mm. And, and just watching the, the, the investments, the commitments, and the thought mm. that DHL puts into the employees all around the world, including supporting what they believe in, mm. like their charitable efforts, yeah. their charitable interests, mm. not only pulling them together and celebrating them and acknowledging them, but also funding them yeah. you know, a, additionally um, and setting up uh, huge events to pull people together and celebrate them, which is taking them out of the work, mm. celebrating them, but somebody's still doing the work. Yeah. So that's there's true. a culture that's supporting people getting recognized and rewarded. Uh, I was able to, to experience it and to see it I've never seen anything like it. Mm. I've never seen anything like it. And, and um, so congratulations to the leadership team just mm. once again on innovating and then actually executing. Yeah. It, 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 these are the decisions that you, you seem to make, mm. just like the CIS program, that you believe in your heart this is the right thing to do for Absolutely. people. Absolutely. And, and then you don't use Excel. No, <laughs> no, no, we just you know. go and do it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, as one, we just do it. Yeah, I, I, and I think, Important thing to note to, to, to say that as well is we're talking about mainly a blue collar workforce, right? We're talking about over 100, in, in Express alone, over 100,000. Now in the whole of Deutsche Post, which is doing the certified program now, over yeah. 500,000 people, of which the vast majority are blue collar frontline uh, a, a employees, right? And sort of getting through to them and getting it motivated. Um, but I think that there's two things in there. I think one, you need the innovation and the drive from the top to come up with the um, with the ideas and to just say, right, we're just going to do it, right? Let's yeah. just, we're just get on with it. I do think it's important, though, that then we build those things, however soft they seem, into a process, right? Because it's like your or it's like your meeting here, right? You don't have to worry about most of the people in that hall there. It's the other ninety percent sure. that, that are not sharing your views right sure. or, or quite at the same quite at the same level so i always i always insist that even if it's a, an appreciation week an employer of the year a town hall it's written into your job description right you know that you will that you will do these things and you know and then we rigorously follow up on it you know we have a employer opinion survey and we obviously do the surveys yeah. that you do right and you know you can tell over that 10-year period, employee engagement went from 63% to 88%. And the one that I'm most um, pleased about was that strategy, knowledge of strategy, went from 56 to 88, which in a business like ours is, is, is almost um, unheard of. But we do monitor it. And then, you know, when we, when we go to a country um, to, to do a business or anything else, one of the first things we do is safety, right? You know, are we losing any days, anybody, any injuries to our people and why? And the second thing is, you know, how were the employee engagement source? How, you know, how was the EO estuary? And, and you get remunerated on that as well, right? If your EO scores aren't going up every year or they're not within a certain range. So everybody gets pulled into that. And then the certified international specialist program as well. That really helped us to, to drive that culture throughout the organization because how would you get to 220 countries, 100,000 people, 42 different languages? And we didn't just translate the in English version into Japanese. We had Japanese people in Japan read it through, understand what it was, and put it into the language of the, the real language of the country. How do you get those messages out? You can't do it by yourself centrally. So everyone, all my management team, um, every country manager, everybody in a regional role, we became facilitators and trainers. We, you know, we worked with the the, the company um, that helped us to develop the program, but we shot all the videos. We, we, you know, we were the main part of the content. And then, you know, we went along for two or three days, especially you know if it's for the for the senior management, and we trained. And then, as often as we can, we go to an induction course where where a person is joining the company for the first time. It's the certified international specialist induction. You know, we give them their passport and we welcome them to the company. You know, as often as we can. Obviously, yeah. we can't get round to, uh, to 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 everybody. So it's really built a sense of, of family and belonging. Um, 
And, you know, that the service profit chain idea has been around for 20 years. That's why I call it, you know, radical, radical simplicity. All the ideas that you ever, ever need, they've already been, they've already been written. It's all about execution now. Yeah. And, 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 and one other thing, it's about belief. Because how you think and feel influences what you say and do. If you say all the right things, but you don't really feel it, it'll come out and people will see right through it. Right. Yeah. So I think you've, you've, you've got to manage in your own way, right? Be yourself because everybody else is taken. You know, you've yeah. got to find the way to get your message over. Um, and then the results start to come. I mean, the Hilton story this morning was amazing, right? But it was almost a parallel to what, to what yeah. we did. The passion from the people was already there. It was just the financial mismanagement. Yeah. It just um, had to be top. unlocked, yeah. really. It just had to be unlocked, yeah. Everybody I've met at DHL is just like you, really <laughs> yeah. fanatic and crazy about DHL. Yeah. And, you know, just yeah. absolutely loving it yeah. because of all it does yeah. uh, for people, you know, and, and, and it's a great business, which you don't talk about much. You talk about the people and the experience mm -hmm. and the customer yeah. Yeah. And, and, and taking care of them. Well, we want and, everybody, you know. Yeah. Yes, okay. it's Monday morning and I'm back to work at DHL. <laughs> right, right. Well, I've actually heard people say that, <laughs> yeah, yeah, um, so, yeah. I, so I, I know it's real. Yeah. And, and it's a book about a turnaround, one of the most successful turnarounds in business, period. Transportation industry. You know? yeah. And yeah. well, I, see, I looked at the numbers. <laughs> it's a very impressive uh, yeah. story. So I, I think for, for readers, for those of you who are listening, if you're in a situation where you have to turn something around, I would read the book. But if you're not in a situation and business is going well, the book's even more important <laughs> yeah. to, to avoid being in a situation. You know, exactly. the, the principles that you lay, lay forth are just great business. And, and there's a subtle point that you, you often talk about is, which is, th this is the way we need to do business and we're going to write it down and this is our process. Exactly. Which is how you get the same amazing result all around the world in un every country that you operate which makes you not only the most international company in the world, I think probably the most incredible <laughs> international company in the world, doing you. this with the people we love the most, working people, okay, on the front yeah. lines. Yeah. And I think that's really important, you know, having done turnarounds and seeing what it's like, I see the most important job for me is to make sure that we don't deviate off the path, right? I never want to be in a situation with a business I've been running for a while that I have to restructure it or lay yeah. people off, right? I want, I want us to be growing every single year. I want us to be looking at opportunity. I want us to be bringing um, people through and, and, and seeing them flourish because, you know, they deserve it. And that's, you know, that's the great thing about, you know, the Lady Gaga clip. Don't let anybody tell you that you're not good enough, you're not pretty enough, you can't dance well enough, you know, that you'll never sell records, that you'll never sell out Madison Square Garden. You just remember you're a goddamn superstar and you were born this way. And what we found is, you know, when, we, when we've launched DHL's Got Talent, you see incredible people doing incredible things and, you know, they, they don't have a senior position. DHL's Got Heart breaks your heart. Yeah. But these are... These are customer service agents who drive 100 miles on a weekend. Yeah, I've seen it. Yeah. I got to see it. And it does break your heart. And the tissues come out, including my own. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a yeah. phenomenal experience. Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, and then, it, and then, and then the, I think it's like, it's like a winning team. The great thing is then it becomes like, almost like a virtuous cycle. It's, it just grows and grows and grows, right? Because the more people um, are enjoying what they're doing, the more that they see that the company cares for them, and the more that they see they've got a secure future, yeah. the more they want to do for the rest of society. The more they want to come back to you and give you ideas. You know, people can't really give ideas unless they feel comfortable and they can see the bigger picture and how everything's working around them, you know? So... It becomes virtuous. Everybody, you know, and then, and, and, and honestly, they're, they're like your, your, your best customers as well, right? Every time, oh, who do you have? Oh, well, I work for DHL, you yeah. know, the most international company in the world. Uh, and that's, I think that's the other good thing that we did, making this very strong bond between our people and our customers, right? So what's, you know, what's the real things that when people look at DHL, what do they really think? Oh, you're the most international company in the world. Right. You know, so, and, and you know, I've seen this, you know, from Apple, Am every, Apple, Amazon, everybody, you know, they see us and they said, right, you know, you're, you're everywhere. You can help us in, in any kind of emergency or, you know, it can be part of the routine distribution for our people. I tell them, you work for the most international company in the world. There's only 100,000 people can say that. You know, tell your, your friends, your family, sure. the guy at the bar, you know, why yeah. are you proud for it? Secondly, 
um, with a market leader. With a market leader. And at the right price point, people always want to work with a market leader because it's a sign of respect to their customers. I'm sending sure. more stuff by DHL. For you as an individual, we don't want you to leave, but we want you to develop. But you can put in your CV, you know, I worked in this position for an international leader in, in the services industry. And then thirdly, you know, the, the whole CIS journey. So customers, you know, they can feel the empathy that comes. They, they, they can see the knowledge that all our people have because they're exceptionally well-trained. So, you know, they see the, the benefit of, of CIS and our people. They just love it. You know, every time you go to a country, they ask you to sign it. You know, they make comments. Um, and it's just, you know, this, this, this is the simple things in life, isn't it? You know, you just put a passport and every time you do a training course, you get a visa. And people love it, especially frontline people. It's just something different. And uh, it's amazing. It's really, I mean, mm. DHL is one of those companies where people have the experience at work that's better than, than some of their experiences sure, outside of yeah. work, yeah. Uh, which is incredible. Mm. That's the family feeling mm. uh, that you've been able to create. That's good. Yeah. So, uh, and I think you've so just one other thing, sorry, Michael, but uh -huh. I, think, I think you create that family feeling and you create the differences by, by building almost a language. Because, you know, as again, as I say, most, just about every strategy is the same, you know, happy people, motivated uh, employees, customers and everything else. But then you, you've got to have things like insanely customer centric. So if, instance, if, somebody, if you were out somewhere and somebody, and somebody mentioned insanely customer centric, I think you'd think about DHL probably because we use that word, big yellow machine, to describe our um, operations around the world. Best day every day. Do or do not. There is no try. Yeah. You know, there's a, there's a vocabulary that's, that's, that's coming there um, that, again, it just brings people um, together a lot more. But in terms of DHL's got heart, yeah. just, I, I found, yeah. well, well, here's here's a quote. We don't believe it helps anyone to shut down operations or apply sanctions. When this happens, it's always the poorest people who suffer the most. You should never cut an hourly worker before you have dealt with the staff in your corporate headquarters. I mean, th that's yeah. an unusual thing to hear from the top of an organization. <laughs> yeah. It's probably the only time it's been said yeah. uh, from the top of an organization. Mm -hmm. You know, what, what makes you know that uh, and want to communicate that so the whole world can hear it and read it? Well, again, I mean, I, I remember if I go back to my football example, right? So we had the Iranian girls team there, right? And that's the, you know, everybody knows all the problems that's going on yeah. in Iran. There's all these sanctions going on. They all came up to us and just begged us not to close down because they love DHL, they love the customers, and they're not interested in government issues whatsoever, right? Yeah. Um, and so it's, it's, it's very painful when things like that happen, right? You know, you know, we're in every war zone in the world. We're still operating in Syria. We're still operating in Iran. People say, well, how do you, why do you do that? And I say, well, first of all, because our people there want us to, right? You know, it's bad enough being in a war zone, even worse if you've got no job. I mean, sure. obviously we don't expect them to go out when, there's, when things are happening, but yeah. you know, they, you know, they want to be part of something, you know? Yeah. Can you imagine if you had to sit at home for a year sure. and not do anything? And people want and need things. Yeah, exactly. Well, I, th I think one a good example of that, Michael, is look at the coronavirus in China at the moment. Who are the people out there delivering um, foodstuffs and essentials to people's houses? No, it's not DHL necessarily, but it's couriers. It's, sure. it's, it's people, you know, that are on the front line, that, you know, they're helping overcome a lot of these things. And therefore, you know, yeah, the, the sanction piece, I, I just don't think. And then the, the other point about, you know, who do you cut first? It's like I said before, you know, when a company is in trouble, it's the fault of the CEO. Unless, unless there's some major global yeah. calamity. But, you know, from a routine business perspective, you know, it's the CEO and his senior team, right? And, you know, these are the people that we should, uh, we should address first. And, you know, our first thought should be how many frontline jobs can we save from this mess? Yeah. yeah. And then and then when you go around and you explain to people what you're doing and why you're doing it and why you think you can give them a future, it's amazing um, the goodwill you build up. I mean, when we closed the United States domestic piece down, it was a lot of people. And we, had to, you know, we dealt with the Teamsters Union, but when we explained it, we never lost a day to strike. You know, it was painful. And, you know, we were as generous as we could on severance packages and everything else. But if you've got the... The presence to explain to people why you're doing things, yes. you know, that's that's a, that's a big thing. It's like, again, one of your guests said today, 
over communicate. You can never communicate enough. Communicate, communicate, communicate. Just tell people why you're doing it. And then, you know, leave yourself open to questions, right? Yeah. And be, make sure that you're prepared to answer them. And I think that makes a big difference. Okay. Is there any final suggestions that you have for our audience, <laughs> um, you know, uh, who are listening? Um, uh, either to help them in their business career. Um, I, I mean, I'm sure most of, most of them want to work for DHL now. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Uh, but anything yeah. else that you'd like to offer or share? Wow. Look, I sometimes make fun of finance people, and I, 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 <laughs> I, and, and I can do that because I, I come from a finance background originally. Um, but, you know, when, when I think about radical simplicity as applied to uh, the finance world, I tell everybody, revenue is vanity. EBIT is sanity. Cash flow is reality. And lastly, you know, you can't have your cake and EBIT. You've got, you, <laughs> you've got to keep getting more productive, right, to, to, to keep growing. But my, my point there is as well is I, I, a lot of the problems I've seen is, is people chasing a revenue growth figure, right? And, 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 and to do that, they go outside of their core business and what they're really good at. And they, you know, they start chasing it down. Um, just to keep the top line growing. You know, I've seen cases where the, the new revenue doesn't even cover the variable costs. But, you know, that's it. These people get the wrong kind of growth mentality. I really think from, from focus comes growth. If you know intimately every detail of your business, and this is why you need to educate the salespeople a lot as well, right? You know, everyone's a salesperson. That's one of the things that we sell in, say in detail. Everyone's a salesperson. And we sell, 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 but sell core business, sell value add, you know, don't sell price. Um, and I think that's one of the pitfalls that people fall into. And, and also, you know, one of the successes that we had is in pricing. If you're asset owner, you have to make sure that you're, you know, you're recovering your investment. And, you know, you've got to be, as CEO, you've got to be very strong in your discipline there and make sure that, sure that you don't start to go down to try and buy business, right? Because then if the market leader's not pricing at the right level, then the whole market is going to be destroyed, yeah. right? Um, but no, I think, I think what I'd say to everybody and in, in whatever profession now, and this is the great thing about, Michael, what you're doing with great places to work for all, again, a touch of genius, um, you have to have people skills, great people skills, right? You know, uh, whether you're finance, a, uh, HR, well, HR obviously always have, um, but whatever role you're doing, you've got to get close to your people. The, the days of command and control are gone. Nobody's going to want to work. Nobody that's worth having is going to want to work in that environment. It's about coaching. It's about great tools. It's about a big picture f um, for the future. So I think we all need to do that. And then the other one that I insist for all our people is, you know, you have to have some kind of customer interface. How can you be in a business if you don't know what the customer's expectations are or, what, or how the customer's changing or how the customer um, perceives you, right? You know, you can do a lot of measurement. Um, but, you know, I say to my, especially the managers, 70% of your time in the field, either visiting customers or out with your frontline people. Go on a courier ride, sit in customer service. I'll tell you what, sit in customer service for a day and you'll know that your service is not as good as what you think it is, right? Yeah. Um, and that affinity to frontline people, because um, they feel it. Uh, and if I could just end on one last thing. I realized during this whole journey, people got to know me well, even at you know the, the, the frontline level. And if I ever went out anywhere, people would listen to what I've got to say out of respect and everything else. But I'm not sure that they really took it all in, right? And that's why, you know, we've gone to the next level with this um, SIM for Supervisors Academy, you know, where we put our supervisory level people, you know, the people who are managing people on the front line through an 18-month course and we graduate them, you know, with yeah. bought mortar hats and everything. Because if your supervisor tells you this is a great company, this is a great place to work. They care about you. They care about your future. We'll give you the, you know, the best terms and conditions that we can. If the supervisor tells them that, that's going to have a powerful effect. Yeah. Powerful. Well, we work with companies all around the world, over 10,000 of them. There is no company making the commitment that DHL is making in first-time supervisors. 
Mm -hmm. uh, there's absolutely no, con no, mm -hmm. no company making that commitment and doing it using technology, mm -hmm. um, which is, again, probably the CFO isn't happy, but you know already <laughs> yeah, the result good. that you're going to get. Yeah. Ken, congratulations Thank on you, on on all you you've accomplished. Uh, you've done a lot of turnarounds. This one is truly remarkable, and you're still adding value, mm. uh, tremendous value uh, to DHL. You're one of those great leaders that I don't have to worry. You're not going to have to turn anything around <laughs> twice. Um, uh, you've learned your lessons and yeah. created a lot of great yeah. people. And I also know you're a great leader who immediately says, "It's not me, it's my team." <laughs> yeah. Okay, but leadership matters. It does matter. Me, and, me, I, 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 you know, I, you know, I'm very proud. You know, John Pearson who's taken over. As you know. Uh, he's very focused on the on the on the same kind of things, but he but he will do things in a different way, right? And I think that's why that you know that rotation of management every f ten years, let's say, I think is I think is a is a very good thing. All right. Well, thank you very much thank for you. joining us on better Loved it. on better uh, for this podcast. It's going to be great for our audience. I personally enjoyed it as well. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much, thank Ken. You. You've been listening to Better by Great Place to Work. The producers are Lizelle Festejo and Katie Van Geffen. Audio and video production is by Resonate Recordings. Better is generously sponsored by DHL Express, the global market leader in international express delivery. Tell us about your great workplace experience by finding us on social media. We can be reached on Facebook and LinkedIn at Great Place to Work and on Twitter and Instagram at GPTW underscore US. Also tell your friends about Better, which can be found wherever you download your favorite podcasts.